So next up is Greg, and uh, he's going to talk about ADF a little bit. Hi. Um, so I think the best way to explain ADF as sort of a motivation behind it is to give a little backstory for why it exists. Um, a few months ago, I was working with some new hardware, and since sort of the, the death knell for FBDev is about ready to sound, we were looking at can we use DRM slash KMS as a alternative for um, getting buffers onto the display. And so we decided to take this new hardware and, um, bu and sort of create a hardware composer for it that was based around KMS. And the experience we had showed us that there were a few issues with implementing a hardware, a Android hardware composer HAL around a KMS driver using sort of all the built-in mechanisms of KMS and not like doing a run around with private IOCTLs and things like that, like the people have traditionally done with FBDEV. Um, the, the four main points we came up with was, was first that the um, KMS API is fairly complex. It's geared towards incremental updates, so say issuing a, a request to alter one plane at a time, which is just, it's not the way that the Android Harbor Composer works. It gives you a set of buffers and a configuration for those buffers and wants them to be atomically updated. Um, I know Rob Clark has been working on um, nuclear page flip, which is an atomic update for KMS, and that solves the problem of, uh, in the sense that you can now do atomic updates and they're not incremental, but it doesn't really solve the problem of the complex API. Uh, basically, it looks like ra rather than you getting incremental updates one at a time, you get them all bashed up at once. Um, we also found that the DRM object model of you have CRTCs, possibly some extra planes attached to them that drive one or more encoders, and each encoder drives exactly one connector. That doesn't always fit embedded hardware. Um, in particular, the hardware we were looking at at the time um, had the capability that you, or actually requirement that if you wanted to drive a high resolution display, you needed to gang together multiple CRTCs. And there was just no way within the DRM object model to represent something like that. Um, we also found that, that there was a lot of boilerplate code we had to, had to write around things like gem and frame buffer management, which wouldn't be a big deal, except a lot of stuff is already handled within DMA buff. It already has its own reference counting and sharing semantics. And so even with the prime helpers, helpers we felt like we were writing a lot of boilerplate code. And yes? One quick note is KMS is actually doesn't require gem. Um, there is one driver in VMware graphics that doesn't do gem. So when you create a frame buffer object that you can scan out, you pass in a handle. For everyone but one, it's not a gem object. But so that's just um, just FYI. Okay. Um, and the others, a couple of smaller points that we had uh, were that there was no support built in for custom pixel formats. Um, this is something that we see very commonly on embedded hardware, both in the sense of you have, say, video blocks, video decoder blocks that produce unusual YUV formats that the display can scan out, but you don't want to have to convert to get it sort of into a standard YUV format just to satisfy KMS. Um, and also the explicit support that, support that Eric has been talking about. Um, we figured out with the atomic mode setting, you could sort of pass in incoming sync objects as a property. I, I think it was a property of the frame buffer, which was kind of a hack, but it worked. Um, the bigger problem was that the frame buffer driver needs to also pass a sync fence out, saying when these buffers are ready to be reused because they're longer on the screen. And there was just no mechanism to be able to pass something out of the um, atomic page flip. So based on, these, um, based on these findings, we decided, well, what if we were to redesign a, what would it look like just sort of as an experiment to design a new display framework based around the, the primary primitive being you have a bunch of buffers you want to atomically get on the screen. And based around new kernel, like things like DMA buff and sync fences. So reusing existing kernel um, mechanisms wherever they existed. And what we came up with was ADF, the Atomic Display Framework. And um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just cover a couple points of it that I think um, 
were the most discussed are DRI, de DRI devel. Um, and the first of these is the ADF object model. Um, it is sent, it's a little bit similar to the DRM object model, um, but it's somewhat simplified and with some constraints removed. So the basic idea is that um, objects, is that your, your display engine is split up into two different kinds of objects, overlay engines, which are sort of hardware blocks or combinations of hardware blocks that produce an image, and then interfaces, which are the things that scan out the image. So an example would be, for instance, we have this configuration where we have one block that mixes together buffers into an output image, and then it's mirroring out into an HDMI connector and a VGA connector, uh, each of which is represented as a separate interface. And then in parallel, we have two separate blocks that are ganged together that are both driving a high-resolution DSi interface. And one of the key things that ADF does is it says basically any end-to-end -end configuration you want to tie together that's actually represented by the hardware, ADF is okay with. Um, K KMS's object model is much more rigid in the sense that you can't, say, have multiple CRTCs driving a single encoder, which is a use case that we needed for this particular piece of hardware. And then collectively, the overlay engine and the interface are known as a device, and that's sort of the unit that you can atomically update. Um, so to, to atomically update the screen, first I want to walk through sort of how you describe a buffer to ADF. Um, this is the kernel-facing um, interface that for describing a buffer, there's a equivalent user space which basically just replaces some of these objects with FDs. Um, so basically, each buffer is a collection of DMA buffs and sort of offsets and pitches into those DMA buffs, one per plane. Um, you also specify some basic metadata about the buffer, uh, its width, its height, its format. These are used so the ADF can actually validate things like making sure you haven't specified a buffer that's too large for the actual memory backing it. Um, and you also specify the target overlay engine so they can validate, for instance, that this particular piece of hardware can actually scan out the format that you've provided. Um, and then optionally, you can pass in a sig fence which says um, when this buffer is uh, available to be displayed. Um, or if you pass in a sig fence of null in the kernel or use minus one for a user FD, um, then that means that basically the the buffer is ready to display, or as Eric had discussed, we could potentially extend it to mean that there is some kind of implicit sync contract that the driver is going to deal with. And so a post is specified very simply. It's just a collection of buffers. Um, there's also some additional mapping information that ADF provides for you. Basically, it just calls in the DMA buff framework to map into the device for you um, when, the driver, when the buffers come in from the client. And the actual um, specification of the, of the configuration, so for instance, the position of all the buffers on the screen, what kind of blending parameters you're using, scaling, things like that, that is stored inside of a, um, of a I hate to use the word binary blob, but that's effectively what it is. Um, it's a custom structure that is private to your driver that specifies how the screen is laid out. And so I'll walk you very quickly through what it looks like to actually update the screen. Um, when the client issues a request to ADF to update the screen, ADF will go through, um, it will import the buffers. Um, so in the case of this coming from user space, it actually imports the FDs into DMA buff objects, then takes a reference on them, and it does some basic sanity checking um, if it's a standard format. So like, for instance, making sure that you aren't trying to read out two megabytes of data from one megabyte buffer, things like that. At this point, it defers to the driver to do hardware-specific validation. Um, so for instance, making sure that, that, the, um, that you aren't trying to, say, validate a bandwidth constraint that ADF wouldn't know about. Um, and so your driver implements an op where it gets passed in the post configuration and the description, the, um, the driver private description of the composition. And at this point, the driver can both validate that the configuration is valid, and it's also allowed to assemble some kind of internal state. So for instance, let's say that your, um, that your hardware has to do some sort of bandwidth calculations, and you don't want to redo them when it comes time to actually post this to the screen. Well, you can actually allocate a little bit of state, pass it back to ADF, and then eventually when it comes back onto the screen, that state will come back to you, and you can refer to it when it, when it actually gets on the screen. Um, at this point, 
the driver has said, yes, this, this configuration's okay, go ahead and move forward. And so what ADF does is it places it on a queue. ADF then has a separate worker thread, which, is, which goes through and in a FIFO order, dequeues um, the configuration from the screen. And if there are sync fences attached to these buffers, it waits for them to fire before it actually passes them to the driver. That way the driver knows if it's using explicit sync. By the time it's actually been asked to post them, the drivers are ready to go. I'm sorry, the buffers are ready to go. Um, at this point, ADF calls back into the driver to do the hardware-specific sort of register updates for actually updating the contents of the screen. And so the, um, the driver is passed in the same configuration that it had before, and the, so if it allocated any driver state and passed it back with the validation, then it's passed in the same driver state. Um, the driver is then at this point expected to update the screen to match this configuration, and it has to, at this point, wait for the flip to actually take effect. So there's a contract here that by the time the post has returned, the associated configuration that was passed in is actually visible on the screen, and the previous state is, is able to be freed. And since this is the contract we have, at this point, the ADF worker thread actually advances the sync timeline to signal to user space. This, this previous set of buffers is now available to be reused. And additionally, ADF will go in and clean up, for instance, it will release its mappings and its, um, its DMA buff, uh, its, um, it'll release its DMA buff um, uh, handle on it so that basically, because DMA buff has built-in ref counting, it may be freed at this point. Or if it's being used by something else, then it will still survive. Um, then finally, if the driver actually allocated any internal state with this post, this is where the driver is called back into to actually clean that up. And typically, that's just calling into free, because you just malloc some kind of structure, and now you're being asked to free it up. Yes? If your display's got an MMU, is there any way to cache the mapping of that DMA buff into that um, VA? Or do you have to, every time the display wants to actually display the buffer, it's only got the DMA buff FD, so it has to re remap that in? Um, that's a good question. So I believe that depends on the DMA buff implementation because um, the ADF just calls into the, I don't recall the name of the DMA buff function, but there's a, there's a function you can call the DMA buff to, to do an attachment, and then I believe there's a separate one to do a mapping, right, and okay. it just uses those ops. Um, your DMA buff driver may internally cache those. ADF doesn't attempt to do that. Right, because I mean, one of the things I like about having to import a DMA buff into a gem handle is that that gem handle, at least, in our implementations is a, 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 a mapping, represents mm -hmm. a, a mapping of that buffer into our, our GPU or um, displays VA. Okay. But that, that presupposes that you can identify the set of buffers that might end up on the screen, which in Android is any buffer. So, I mean, any, any, any Gralic buffer, for instance. Um, so yeah, internal GPU buffer, sure not. But so, so you could cache all those mappings, you could import all of your buffers, and then when you free them, pull them back out. This is not necessarily the case on desktop systems where you have like special allocation requirements for scan out buffers. Normally, some way or another, when you're allocating the buffer, you're setting a usage bit, like I'm, I'm gonna potentially scan this buffer out. And then behind the scenes, when you allocate it, you do whatever you need to make sure it has the right alignment or, or, or things like that. Yeah. Right. Normally, I think, and, like... And, and no, no knowledge of the future of train to train unless you know if this buffer is going to be used in the app you know, way to use it in the home button. So many events that... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's... Yeah, it's getting a little bit off the topic, but I think the short answer to what you asked is it depends on the implementation of the 
DMA bus. Uh, I'm sorry, can, could you repeat that? The worker thread for processing these posts, is it a common thread for all displays? It's per device, which depending on how your hardware is architectured and how you want to write your driver, um, there could be multiple displays per device or it could be one display per device. So the, um, your, your policy would sort of determine how you decide what a device is. So the question is, if, if you, say, have a piece of hardware which, which can drive multiple displays, um, so for instance, it has multiple overlay engines which can drive multiple interfaces, um, whether or not you want to expose that as multiple devices or expose that as a single device with sort of internal connections um, depends on whether or not, depends on two things. First, it depends on whether your um, hardware can atomically update them both at the same time, and it depends on whether you, know, you actually want to do that. Um, I guess that makes sense that you're going to, if you choose whether or not it overlays in one place or the other, that you have this sort of, re like another resource allocation problem, or you have to have some common point where, okay, I'm ready to turn off this overlay, stop scan out from one display, and get ready to scan out the other. So, I, I, I guess that naturally fits into the single sort of cute model. Um, I guess given this experiment, That's a good question. Um, when you get to that, I have some thoughts on that. Um, I don't know if I'm if you have more slides you want to cover first or not, but uh, I, we're into the tea break now. So yeah, I don't think this is real important. We have some time to discuss more and in fact, the scan has extensions right up next. Here's probably the only in other slide I really wanted to cover, which is here's where the, you can find the patches I submitted to DRI Devel if you want to take a look at them. And also, we have done a proof of concept implementation on top of Nexus 10. So somewhere sitting in my office, I have a Nexus 10 that's actually running Android without FBDev in the kernel anywhere. Um, and one of the statistics, statistics I like about this is the, um, the display controller driver that was formerly on FBDev Converting it to ADF actually cut about 1,500 lines of code out of the driver. Okay. So we do T break first. Well, right? take the okay. We well, okay. The very small thoughts are, the, you know, at a thousand mile, you know, mile view or a thousand foot view, Wayland, a Wayland compositor is the same thing as Surface Flinger. I mean, compared to. X with a separate window manager, which is a very different model. So on the Linux desktop, we're a little behind Android, but we're getting to the point where we really need all the same features as far as, well, especially Atomic Update. But I think we do probably want to be able to support things like ganging up uh, multiple CRTCs on an encoder. We want to split out the primary plane from the CRTC to better model hardware where you're, um, you know, I mean, if you look at a CRTC, it's basically a plane plus something. Um, and exposing that as a plane gets it. Uh, makes it better able to model uh, hardware where planes are really independent things. So, uh, Well, I mean, it depends on what you define as a plane to be. So first, is in the KMS definition, a plane has an image attached to it. Um, a lot of hardware in embedded systems can scan out things like custom colors right. and, and have no image attached to it. And in fact, Android has the capability for I don't know if it's exposed to applications, but at least the Hubbard Composer Hal has the capability to say, this layer is not an image, it's a color. 
Right, so some of that stuff we can do with custom properties. So basically where I wanna go with KMS, split out some things like primary planes, uh, add better support for things that more than one hardware supports, and then custom properties for things that, you know, one or small number of hardware supports. Um, so the solid fill color, for example, I think that would make sense as a, as a property. Um, we do have a s currently like a slightly different approach with Weston where we have a generic user space that's sitting on top of this API rather than having a per driver component in user space. But I think eventually it's gonna morph more towards a sort of thing where you have generic fallback but some sort of ability to plug in something with hardware knowledge that can know I can do some things. Or maybe the custom properties, since they're queryable, become sort of analogous to GL extensions where a generic user space can say, oh, this hardware has this capability, I can do something special. So ha having, this may not be the right time for this discussion, but having dealt with all kinds of different display hardware and seeing the very weird things that, that vendors do with it, I don't think you can possibly anticipate everything you need to, to describe all the constraints as yeah, properties. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the solid fill color is probably something easy to do generically. The bandwidth constraints and scaling constraints are, I can't think of a generic way to express those. Um, those two are sort of the, some of the least the diabolical things that yeah. <laughs> to us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I say, I mean, it's it will we'll try and make as much stuff able to work in a generic way, but probably still eventually plug in. But still, it's going to be mostly common code. Um, well, anyways, um, yeah, I guess we can. Talk. A good break point. So, uh, yeah. I guess